Welcome to episode 33 of Something Inventive. Today we'll be looking at following up our webinar and how it went and the, some of the things that we learned. And Al's going to be talking about hack data, a GDPR fail, and uh, recapture, Google's recapture spam protection service for websites. So let's go back to the top. First look at our webinar, really, and something we talked about last podcast and it was a uh, oh how to describe it it's something i've been wanting to do for ages years a webinar but i've I, i've not been confident enough and not known where to start or what it is and i think between us al and i doing these um podcasts over the last two years and certainly bringing them to video it's made it a lot easier to to take that leap to doing a, a video webinar i mean if i just give it some context first al and then then you can maybe explain how it was for you on the other side when we started so really the reason We've got we've got a lot of clients that I, I often see independently of Al um, and I'll see them on an individual basis. It might be remote. I might go and visit them. We've got lots of people that we work with on an ad hoc basis. And I wanted something really to bring everyone together. So regardless of whether they have full on coaching or, or they just be ad, to, ad hoc to us, that we would have something where every single month we can talk about a topic. Now, five years ago or so, we used to do a lot more workshops and a lot more in person um, events and they were really good fun but they were hard to organize and so this was trying to bring back some of that but without all the travel for me and and everyone else so we'll go into some of the technical details of how how we set it up and and how we got it running but i'm i'm really interested to find out from you al what what you thought of it because it was kind of a something you were dragged into i mean yeah technically we use the same kind of system that we do for the podcasting so it felt familiar so that i think that's important um I also thought that you know the, the system is very simple and and easy and uh that helps when you're doing it it does feel like you're sort of on a tv show a little bit you know there's people at the other end like yeah when the podcast like now can be edited out or you can do it again but when if you're talking to a lot of people on a webinar live you know that sort of you get in that sort of stress loop of like not wanting to know what to say and then you say and you've got to just you've got to run with it so that's uh that's an interesting angle on it i think it's more important to have things well as you know prepared up you know beforehand so to have all the documents you need to use and the links prepared before you know you can't add them in later so you know it's a big undertaking i think in terms of um, planning and of course you never quite know exactly what you're going to say even if it's you you might just go down a rabbit hole so you've just got to be aware of that and come back out of the hole before you've gone too far <laughs> Well, that's right, because um, we've got a limited time because there are people watching live. We can go down that rabbit hole and we can edit it out afterwards, because if it's not if it's not relevant or it's not interesting, we can get rid of it. But with this, you have to you have to be on form. <laughs> you are performing. You're on stage because people are are there uh, spending their time listening to it at that moment. Yeah. And on that note, I think it's good to have more than one person presenting it just so you can bounce ideas off. And you just got that support there because we had a few technical troubles on our one. Mm. And um, while you were talking, I was trying to help the other person trying to do that without looking like I was typing. We had a guest on Annette um, and she was talking about the usability of websites and how you, you go through that process. I, I feel it's quite an important part of a year in review, really, where you look at your website and look at how you can improve it going forwards. And just as I was introducing her as one of the key guests, she drops out. She can't hear me. So she doesn't know what I'm saying or we couldn't hear her. It was just it was it was almost comical. And I. <laughs> I was like, what do I do? What do I do now? I just had to go straight on to Al and get him to introduce himself and then just had to keep talking until eventually yeah. she got back online. Yeah. That was, I mean, um, you can imagine what it's like on a TV show, you know, kind of live. You just don't quite know what's going to happen. You just got to run with it and hope for the best, you know. Yeah. But hey, it's baptism by fire, isn't it? It happened and we dealt with it. I don't, I haven't had any feedback that it was awful. I think that's just what it happens. People do understand the internet works in mysterious ways sometimes. And, <laughs> you know, if your internet connection is clogged for some reason, then that's that's going to happen. What else can we say about it? So this was an email we sent out to people. I don't know if that's coming through. Yeah, really, just trying to explain what the club was, and I I think that was the one of the most difficult hurdles because I I was quite clear in my mind what it was. It was just like let's get together and talk about a subject, and I know that the attendees or the guests are going to have just as much good information as as I am. Put our heads together and share ideas, and we're going to come out of that call better off and moving forward in our marketing. So if, if nothing else, everyone's going to help me as much as hopefully I'm helping them. That was the idea behind it, but it was so difficult to try and articulate that and write it down. And, you know, with the help of Lou, we managed to go over and over this copy and trying to work it out. For me personally, that was the one of the things that I got stuck on so much in terms of getting this started. And until I could articulate exactly what it was, it was tricky to tell anyone else about it. This is something we spent a long time on trying to get the uh, the email out. In fact, I was delayed on putting the email out that we actually 
had to put a mark your diaries date because I wanted just to get the date out there and at least some people to attend and have that date in the diary. You know, I know we've talked about perfection in the past and trying to get things just right. And this was just one of those cases where I didn't want to wait for perfection. It had to go out. We had to say something. And in the end, it was just, it was good enough. And hopefully that people did understand what it was. And we got, we got sign up. So <laughs> some people did. It's hard to know when something's done, isn't it? Yeah. Finished. And if you look at it, the more you look at it, it's like wood for the trees. You just can't see it objectively anymore anyway, after 10 times. No, exactly. And you don't know exactly what's going to resound with people. We hadn't done it before. So I had to, you know, we've got an image of uh, Al and I talking, which I had to make up from other footage that we had from something else that we'd done as a test on the webinar system. You know, there's so much you don't know that it's really difficult to know what's put into it. So I think that was, for me, the, one of the hardest bits about this whole process of mm, developing developing the club. Yeah. So shall we shall we talk a little bit about the technical side of things, what, what we did sort of in the run up to it? I often use Zoom for client meetings, and I know that we've used Zoom for the podcast. In fact, that's that was the first video podcast we did, wasn't it, using Zoom, I think. What I found with Zoom is it's quite complicated, and the cost of it, it wasn't prohibitive, but you had to buy this plan and then add on the webinar plan, and it did more than I needed, and actually it's quite complicated. All of those barriers in the way, I might have gone ahead with it, but there were so many barriers in the way, I sort of backed when and took a look back on the internet and said what else is out there i think go to meeting is one of them or go to webinar that's another service and i've used that before and in the end settled on this system called demio which is what actually what we're using now to record the podcast and i, I can't remember my exact decisions why but i think price was a factor but it was just the sign up process was beautiful that you you sign up you test it out and once you're logged in it goes through a test webinar with you. It's a br mm. it's brilliant. It's got these fake attendees who ask mm. questions and tell mm. you to do things. And then these pop-ups come up and say, well, let's share the presentation notes now. Let's do the handouts. Let's run a video. And while you're showing your video. So it basically gets the whole thing set up, all the little kinks ironed out before you've even done your first webinar going through this mm. process. And I, I thought that was genius. And I found this brilliant because it took you through step by step, not overwhelming you with those particular features. So that's Demio. But it's beautiful. You can share your screen. You can share, you can preload handouts now video you can sort of preload a youtube video and skip through it how about it from your side al you're called like an administrator as part of the system a presenter yeah. how is it for you yeah as you say it's a very slick system technically it was fine there was no apart from you know one of our attendees connection but that was nothing to do with this system no. at all and that was brilliant there was no glitches there was no technical hitches at all the interface is really slick i found uh, yeah the only problems we had was just in the communication so as an admin you kind of get a, a private sort of channel of communication with other admins so you can kind of chat to them but the general audience can't see those and that's all well and good if the other the participant is there <laughs> and of course one of our admins fell out because of their internet connection so i couldn't immediately contact them so another uh, aspect is uh, again it depends on your kind of nature of your webinar i guess is whether you want to have your attendees kind of talking in real time you can unmute them so they can use their mics again that's going to open up probably some technical issues with people's mics because nothing sometimes things just don't work first time the alternative is to have them use the lock chat box because it takes them time to type out their questions or answers they mm. need to be quite short maybe not that insightful depending on what the question and answer is you can run little surveys in that panel too which might be useful if you've got a large number of attendees and you can get some kind of quantitative data out of whatever you're asking see that that was very useful the problem i had with it because i'd not done a webinar like this before is i'm used to standing in front of people or talking to you al or interviewing someone and you can ask a question and you can see if that person is thinking or you can wait for them but when people are typing you don't know whether they a heard you that they are typing a response or they're thinking and you don't know how long you've got you don't to know wait. If they're doing anything at all or even want to ask a question <laughs> no exactly and so what we found there are a couple of points where i would ask a question and i'd leave some time to answer it but that was a little slightly delayed and then i'd have to carry on saying well i'll come mm. back to that and then midway through the next part of what i was talking about the answer would come through and i don't think that was demi i think that was just people um, just taking their time to respond, which is totally fine. So partway through the, the next er item I was talking about, their answer would come through and then I'll get back to it. I think knowing about this, this delay coming through, I, I think the best thing to do is pose questions Absolutely. in advance of when you want the answers to. So pose a question and go on to explain something and then come back to the answer and then have them all in a row and you can just pick yeah, them up. Yeah, I did point. quite a few webinars um, last year 
and um, often they'd have like two or more admins, one person doing the main presenting and then someone else or at least two people monitoring all the questions, picking out good ones and then putting those to the host as if they were the question on asker. Or they would say like, you know, yeah. such and such from where I was asked this question. There's no kind of delay and then yeah, you can pick out private ones and you can kind of remove any that maybe have just been answered in what's been said. Uh, again, yeah. it, it's hard to do on the fly and you might miss some good ones. It might be frustrating for the end people not to ha ever have their question answered. And it depends how many people are in your webinar as well. Yeah, and we, we're not expecting lots to be in it. It's not, uh, we're not expecting thousands of people. This is a club. So actually, um, smaller, smaller numbers probably work better with this sort of thing. Coming and going as they need to, depending on what, what you're talking about. But I did find that was, that was one thing I didn't expect. I, I have been on webinars before, but not a huge amount. But I didn't appreciate that that would be an issue. And it certainly is. So it's something to, to bear in mind next time. What other issues did we come up against? Oh, yeah. So in terms of sharing slides, you can't share anything like a PowerPoint or a keynote on there. You will pre prepare that and then export it out to a PDF. And that works quite well because the moment you're sharing that on screen, that any of the presenters can flip through that. So you can hand it over with ease. You don't have to now say, right, Al, now you need to share that and get back to the same slides. <laughs> So that worked really well. Um, you could share videos on their YouTube videos. And again, any of the presenters could pause, play, and move it to different segments. And then that video would be, or the actions of that video would be replicated onto everyone watching it. So you're not broadcasting that video as such. You're broadcasting a position of where that video is. And that seemed to work quite well as well. So it's a nice, a nice feature, I think. What else? Keeping to time, I found we, we were over time. I think we're about 10, 15 minutes over time. The goal was we would talk about a topic for half an hour and then we'd go to q and I don't think that's going to work into the future because I don't think we can have a live Q&A mm. really. So I think the best thing to do is split the questions or ask questions throughout our presentation and then answer them you know, give, given some delay and waiting for yeah. people to respond. I, I, I mean, the Q&A could work. I think if mics, if they use their mics to ask questions again, technical problems yeah. possibly with people not having mics or not working or something like this it's just much faster and i think it's more interesting to hear other people on it as well yeah there could be i i almost don't trust <laughs> the people who are attending yeah it might be something we can experiment with people might, might not want to if it's lots of people people might be a bit frightened but if it's a, a club like we say and we everyone sort of knows each other and trust each other then that's a really good platform to be able to yeah. sort of ask a question or even answer a question on behalf of someone else exactly and it's not if you if we were doing this in person it's i wouldn't uh, i wouldn't say that people couldn't speak i actively want that so it's um um i think we'll just have to try it out maybe just bring in some of the guests who who can actually be partly part of the presenters and we bring them in early onto the onto the whole thing so they can talk through it i, I guess we wanted to try and keep this as simple as possible mm -hmm. to begin with so that we could actually uh, achieve it and you know what do they call it minimum lovable product NL, i don't know if that, that's what it was in this case yeah it certainly was was fun yeah i like it and and actually as we found that we can use the same software for recording the podcast because it does a pretty good job of the video in fact uh, claire who was editing the video said uh the, the quality was a lot better and came out just just right really in terms of having a big enough videos that appear mm. at the top uh, and then the images uh, the video down below worked out quite well. Um, any other comments on that? I'm trying to think if there's anything else that we found out about really. I think the only other thing that I could have done better is, and I found this with lots of events we run, the hardest bit is getting people to come. I think you can get a lot of people who are interested. And I did a lot of phoning around in terms of um, getting people onto it. Getting people to turn up is the tricky one. And I think I just need a better push near the end when you're getting near, near maybe a couple of days to the, to the webinar in terms of pushing people forward until we reach a nice, uh, a nice mass of people, then it doesn't matter because I think we need a sort of critical mass of attendees to give it some life, but we'll get there. Okay, so moving on, should we do uh, a sponsor? Let's do a sponsor. Let's move over to that. So I, I, I will now nip over to this. Um, so our sponsor is going to be Inventive People. So we've talked about this a little bit before. It's not so new anymore, but um, I think it's it's something where we're finding it's actually becoming more and more useful for, for us as a company in terms of um, having products online, sort of preset mini products online, where we can just point clients to a web page. They can get a really good gist of, um, of what we're going to do for them, and then they can buy it there and then. Um, maybe it's a lot easier than uh, for us redoing the quotes each time. But from your side as a customer, we really found that people just need to get stuff done in their business. They've got lots of the different things to do in terms of their business, all outside of marketing, but such as bookkeeping, call answering, 
event management, marketing, and all that sort of stuff. It's a, a mini project, which we can do for a fixed cost, and we, we know someone who can help with that, and then we've got it on our site. Anyway, if you do need help with any of those marketing angles, just check out inventivepeople.co.uk. If there's anything you don't see on there, but you need help with, just email hello at ratherinventive.com, get in touch. And as a listener to this podcast, you get 20% off your first order with the discount code inventive people so that's 20 percent off your first order so i'd load up that basket if you were interested in joining our club what you need to do to join that because we put that onto inventive people as well so you go to inventive people to go.co.uk you click on the marketing tab at the top and you scroll down and you find the inventive marketing club membership product click on that you've got my smiley face on there and you can either pick one month three months or 12 months i'm going to go for 12 months because it's cheaper i get a, a nice discount on that you add it to cart, so we've got a nice healthy discount there of £50. You fill it out, buy it, and we'll get you signed up to the club. But of course, you can do that for anything that's available on the store. Anyway, moving on. So, Al, I, I want to lead over to you to talk about data from an article that you saw in Wired. So, over to you. Yes, people may have heard there was this enormous collection of passwords and email addresses that have been combined from all the massive hacks that have taken place over the last goodness knows how many years. Although there have been like these things have been leaked before, this was kind of like a mega leak of just, it's called collection number one. I think it's something like, if you scroll down, 2.2 billion, 2 .2 billion? Usernames and passwords. So these things are kind of out there and that's just like an enormous amount of emails and passwords. I suppose it's just to remind people, things are always under attack for being hacked constantly. It doesn't have to be a big site either. It could be a small site. And some of these were hacked from like old systems that just kind of went a bit derelict and then some vulnerability on the server or something. And these have kind of all combined in this massive collections, two, three, four and five cents, which again are very large. So uh, there's a site in here, which I will put a link to called have I been pawned.com. I wish they'd chosen a different name for that, but that's the name. Have I is been pwned? Not pwned. Well, why isn't, why is that a W? Pwned. <laughs> I might be wrong, but I'm pretty I've sure. I've never heard anyone else say I think, it's, I think it's to do with being owned. I, I remember uh, many years ago playing multiplayer games, and when someone kills you and you have to respawn, then they own or pwn you. I'm and it's something like not that. in the right um, circles. When I read that, it just yeah. is missing an A. Okay, so this website enables you to put in an email address. And just to check if you're on many of these lists, again, you might think, oh, maybe this is a site trying to get my information. I, I don't think so. It is run by someone who works at Microsoft, pretty well regarded this site. So I've put a couple of my email addresses in, as I have lots of pseudonyms, as you can imagine. Um, so this is our, this is our main email that yeah. appears so, on our website. So it's obviously so been only on one. Now, the, the underlining thing here is, in essence, as long as you change your password um, after you know about a hack, although sometimes you you don't know they've been hacked for years. And I think in Yahoo, Yahoo's case, it was ages before they even told people. It's important to change your passwords regularly. Really critical to not use the same password and everything. And that sounds really obvious, but people do it because passwords are annoying. You can't remember them. And you're just like, oh, I'll just use this one for now. And then it stays. Some sites ask more complicated passwords, which are difficult to remember. An analogy, would you have the same key for your house, for your car or cars and like a safety deposit box where you keep all your money one key for all of those things and if you did how closely would you guard that key if anyone got a copy of it they could get anywhere they wanted to and it's the same thing with a password if you use the same email address and password then people are going to be able to get in and we've seen um, more attack what's well, called credential stuffing it's essentially people hackers taking this list of usernames of email addresses and passwords and just trying on any online service and not even the main ones like really obscure ones uh, for example, we used Basecamp and there was a notification on there that they'd noticed lots of this credential stuffing going on. Yeah. So they're even trying Basecamp to see, does this work? Does this email and password combination work here? People are just trying it. And it's not that the service has been breached. You know, they they if someone's logged in with a legitimate yeah. username and password, then it's uh, it's very difficult to, yeah. to get around. But I know, I know that um, Basecamp did notice that, didn't they? They yes. noticed this yeah. attack. So they're able to stop it or, or put blocks um, on that. But they did advise everyone to change their password yeah. just because if their password may be used elsewhere, even though they weren't breached, nothing yeah. was leaked. If people are trying, it means that they might feel that they, they've got some, some chance now, of getting in. So there's other, well, how can you protect yourself from this? First, if you have your own domain, you can use different email addresses for different sorts of things that you might do. If you own your own domain, you can make an infinite number of email addresses and just have them all forward into one. I use that. So you could have different email addresses. So that's, that's one way of spreading the burden, as it were. Other way, clearly use different passwords for everything. Now, how to manage that in real life? Well, on browsers, often you get like a password a suggestion thing that's really handy but let's say you've got something like i don't know netflix or amazon prime or something or even like iplayer where you have to log in on your tv or something else and you're like oh, i can't remember the password because it's like 28 random characters and you can't remember it. so you write it down again bit of a weakness so then you end up resetting it to something simple because so you can remember it put it in duh, 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 and then you just leave it so one thing i 
got from a talk I went to at Bath Fest Digital Festival a couple of years ago from NatWest Fraud Team. Not to use the same password, but to use a, so a password format that you know what it is, but you can apply to a different website. It will be different for every website, but the rules that you use are the same. So you could go to any website and think, how did I, how would I have made the password for this site? And you piece it together out of maybe, let's say, three pieces of key information that no one else could know. And then maybe something else to do with the site itself. I'm not going to give too much away as to how I do it. I do have... <laughs> Tell us your rule, No, <laughs> but I do have a format so I can go to any site and I go, yeah. I know what my password is for this site. And I know they're all different for every site. Well, okay. I won't, I won't, I won't try and guess your format. I'll, t- I'll tell you uh, a way that okay. I've... Um, learn to look at it. it's actually this was from LastPass, which is something we use internally and so what LastPass suggested is to think of something like four or five words that are disconnected but that you can remember in one mm-hmm. phrase because essentially the security comes from the length of the password phrase that you put in the longer it is the more difficult it is for a computer via brute force to work out what that password is. And so if you can take your five words and string them together, then you can make quite a long phrase out of that, but you can still remember it. But once you have that master password, you make that as long as you can remember. But then for me, all other passwords I use generated by Keychain on the Mac. So the Mac will generate a, a long random string of digits and it will store that in LastPass. So I don't remember any of those. Yeah, and, and usually we, I'm using 32 um, character length Pretty for good. that sort of password. And also <laughs> using um, words as well as symbols and numbers and upper and lowercase. Again, it's all very, you've probably heard, people heard it a lot. I, what, from what I've heard, it's um, it doesn't really matter because the way computers work is that they'll they'll churn through a whole the whole character set randomly. So it really doesn't matter what, what, what the... Cur- the visual complexity of the code is that you're looking at. It's the length that is that's the most true. If, let's well by introducing symbols because that's more characters. I guess it's better because it's the hacker or the the bot or the script that is hacking has to go through a wider range of symbols yeah. in terms of it for each character. So yes, it's better that the hacker knows that we're using symbols. When you, let's say you've got 26 characters, letters, or if you're using capitals, you've already doubled that. If you're using symbols and you're adding another, well, goodness knows how many other characters, and then you're timesing it by the number of characters you have would make it more secure. Surely you'd use as many characters yeah. as you could. Surely that's better. In terms of that, I guess if you think about all those variations that you just listed, like, so you've got your 26, mm. your double, and then whatever the characters are, and then all foreign characters, Characters and or foreign language characters, I should say. I don't know how many characters that's yeah. going to be that a uh, computer could possibly run through, because then it has to run through all of them. If all passwords were numbers between one and ten or one and nine, that'd be really quick. So, in terms of advice, yes, it's like knowing that people have these ca- ca- random um, passwords. But you know, you look at a lot of password generators now, and I think Apple, the way they generate the passwords, I don't know how long it is actually. I think it's three or four sets of six characters random digits which could be numbers or letters not symbols they create uniform formatted passwords and it's a slightly head start isn't it yeah yeah absolutely i mean i guess you could say let's take a chance that this is a, an apple yeah. user account maybe it's, it's at icloud.com so we can say right that's an apple iCloud account so we know that it's going to have a hash and here no, and, and as hash you say here, not as you admit there. no right. symbols so that's all already yeah. slightly easier yeah but the yes, length of it is that is crucial it, it, um so yeah longer is longer is better more, more more complex i think as long as it's not it, it's more difficult to guess because one of the first things they're going to do is they're going to go through um lists like these ones on the internet and they're going to run your email against known passwords that people use that's the very first thing they'll do it's having a common password that's the key problem certainly you don't want password you don't want um simple names um, but it used to be the case that your password yeah. needs to be at least eight characters so people will do eight characters <laughs> and password is eight characters yeah. and then you password one also yeah. one two three could be useful for people is that um as depending on the complexity of the site or how important it is whether it's holding financial data or lots of information about you is to change that password to have a reminder to say i need to change my bank password maybe some key communication um twitter obviously you don't want that going into the wrong hands anything which if you lost it would be a real problem for you making sure that those passwords are changed regularly because again that makes it more of a problem so even if there was a breach who really has time to do that no one ever does do that (laughs) yeah I just I did it this morning actually. But yes, good. It's um definitely worthwhile. And and particularly if you even if you forget forget about your own personal security, go on make sure that if you are managing any websites that you either for you or a client that you go on and make sure those pass admin passwords are changed regularly and they're long and and strong because uh you know, that's you, know, you may not care about your own data being stolen or used or abused, but if it's a client or um your company, then your reputation can be damaged. The letter ends. <laughs> yes.
<laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so actually, that was quite a long one. So could, do you mind just skipping through this uh, GDPR I fail? Think, essentially, I went on to book um, some accommodation at a accommodation provider that I use. Yep. And as part of that process, they were using a third party booking engine. I was able, it's just said, if you're a returning customer, pop an email address to populate all of your information. No password, no previous booking number, just an email address. So I put my email address, there comes my details. Now I found that incredibly bad, even before like the GTPR kind of well, you know, world. So you, you weren't no, logged in in any way. You didn't anyone, have a cookie stored on there. That you didn't have no, to verify it. You didn't no, have to wait for an no. email. I know someone else who goes to that campsite. I put in their email address. I got their home information, their home telephone number, right. and everything. Can I try? You I, can't won't, I won't share because it. I um, email them you... about it. It's terrible. As a customer, I don't need that kind of facility that you know information to be accessible. There was no GDPR stuff on there, so I couldn't opt out of this thing. If I'm a customer of theirs, I'm breachable by this system. And imagine that what we just talked about the seven million passwords. If they got this system, they could just poll it wait till they get hit you got your home address phone number potentially you could work out when you're on holiday which isn't ideal and they have fixed they have it. today yes they've taken it off although i'm actually not convinced that you could probably still access it in the background i think the system's quite old and i would su suspect that other clients have also got this on i mean they the people who made this booking system haven't thought it's a problem it's only because their client has said to them they want to remove it also it's not even under https i can see how those sort of things might happen if it's if the developers made something they haven't been called back in and the company is still using it but someone would you would think even a customer I, I, like you customer. would have just would have pointed this would have pointed this out oh, sooner. I know. And how comes they haven't noticed? I mean, they've clearly had no kind of GDPR audit because that. I mean, that's a blinding obvious fail. Yes. I don't know. I guess uh, the message is if you see something you don't think is right, <laughs> tell someone. <laughs> you know, email them and and get yeah. them to change it. You know, it's now it's removed from there. So good. Well, I yeah, and I think that's the right thing to do. I certainly do it. I, I've not seen a gross mistake. Uh, as big as that um but if i see any mistakes on people's sites or failing forms i definitely will tell them because it is really helpful because sometimes you can't tell you know not every website has uptime checking or form testing or you know don't be too frustrated when these things happen because they do happen and it's if you tell them mm. then they can fix it but next on, on the list we've got recapture i can't remember what sparked this topic exactly but i remember i was putting it on for a client recently to reduce the spam coming through on their forms just maybe let's dive into what recapture is i'll bring up up the uh, page that might help. So the idea of it has been around yeah. for a while. Um, its original format was something like um, two words. They looked like badly written words. The whole process behind it is that these were scans taken from, uh, could be books, I think a lot of them, and recapture were using the power of people on the internet to say, tell us what these words are. And they would give you one scan where they knew what the words were, and then the one, the word next to it was something that they didn't know. And they might swap them around. You wouldn't necessarily know what it was. And so you could type in the word hello because you, it would clearly say hello on the screen. And then the other word said room. Now, a computer couldn't read it, which is why it sort of flagged up. But we could read it and, and put it in there. And then they can use that data to say, OK, so when we see that, it actually means a room, not what mm. we thought it meant. And you know, through millions, if not billions of people going through and giving them this information, they actually were able to clear up that, that scanning list. They were bought by Google at some point. Um, and since they finished that recapture method, they've started up a new one where they get people to to identify objects or storefronts or bridges uh, is something I've yeah. been seeing coming up on screen. Just to show you an example that we've got on screen at the moment where it's asking people to select all images with cars. And the, the whole point of doing this is that it's saying that computers couldn't identify what some of these objects are. So if you want to prove you're a person, if you can identify the unknown objects and the known objects, then we know you're a person because computers it, couldn't do It's kind of saying, are you a person or, or, or a machine? And it's that test. Yeah. And there's been, as you're saying, various mm. sort of incarnations of proving you're a person at the other end. The, I mean, the irony being, there's a school of thought saying, well, we, you know, we're actually training AI better to be able to recognize these things. So it's kind of like an arms race of recognizing and understanding things. So the more we actually fill out these captures, you know, there's a school of thought saying this is actually training automatic self-driving cars to work out what a car yep. is and what a bridge looks like. But as we go through, the computers are getting better and better at being able to identify things that mm. people can identify. An article I read, which is a link that we'll put a link on, it's just saying, what what is it to be human? Like, how do you prove you're a human? What is it that all humans have in common that they can all do that you can say to a computer, I'm this is I'm a person, not a machine. And it's difficult because people will get things wrong. People, the storefront and car stuff, people get it wrong all the time. And it's really, really frustrating. They yeah. don't know there's like a little bit of a car in the back and you miss it. And it's like, ah, you know, it happens all the time. I've had that before. But I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. 
it looks like a storefront, but it's not. And there's another one that says, you know, choose other ones with cars. And so p- some people wouldn't choose the ones with vans in. And that was like yeah. wrong. It's not hard. And again, how do you cross that sort of cultural and, and identification sort of boundaries that people have and, and standing? Now, there's a new recapture system, which kind of replaces this kind of select visual selection thing. There's a new one that's kind of replaced that, which is kind of a silent one. So a lot you'll see a lot mm. of forms that don't have captures on anymore because actually it's in the background and there's, it's called like version three, which you're looking at here. And it, it does that by working out your kind of mouse moves and uh, other factors to work out if you're really a person or not. And it will flag up. I think it does flag up to those things if it suspects you're not a, you're not a person. Detecting if you're a person based on it, what you're doing and what, what you have been doing previously, which is, which is a kind of interesting way of looking at it. So for me, if I'm thinking from a company standpoint, I'd much prefer to use the silent option because I don't want it to get in the way of a potential customer filling out a form. I think previously we've used Askimet, owned by Automatic, WordPress is uh, sort of uh, owners or uh, carers, so to speak. So they own Askimet and that would tie in with Contact Form 7 and a few other services to identify emails because that was all about comment spam. So it was using the same technology. And that worked quite seamlessly, but you had to sign up for an account and it was a, a, a paid account for commercial, whereas Recapture is not. There is a benefit to Google, of course, being on lots of sites like this in that they collect more data about how people are moving between sites. Because obviously, if you can, if you think about it, the data it's using to help work out whether they're mm. real people is unlikely to be gleaned no. from one website. It's more likely to be gleaned Indeed. from all the websites where that cookie or that IP touches the internet yeah. and, and yeah. recapture it, yeah. sees them. So in some way, it's a bit like the Facebook comment systems that Facebook puts in place that allows them to track. Mm. Um, so I guess there may be some issues if you're blocking that sort of tracking that might might cause some issues on it but so far it yeah. seems to work quite well and as far as i can see the tracking isn't um they're not tracking anything yeah. too and people may yet. say oh i don't want to be tracked around the internet but you kind of are already in google analytics on most sites okay so the, the, the alternative is to fill out various questions to prove you're a human being that's the alternative unfortunately <laughs> what i did like on this um document at the bottom is that obviously there's lots of re- uh research into the best way of doing of proving you're a person and there was one that was um, doing this complicated kind of question and answer uh, thing. Game involving optical <laughs> illusions and logic puzzles that humans have great difficulty in deciphering. Called a Turing test via failure, the only way to pass is to get the answer wrong. <laughs> which is a really interesting way of turning on its head. So a computer would just try and get it right. Of course, as humans, you're like, oh, I don't know. And you get, and the only way to get through this form or whatever is to get it wrong. Because that, that's what proves you're human because you can't do it. A computer is cleverer than you are. Yeah, and t- until be- computers become clever enough that they are then thinking like humans and going, ah, what would a human do? Wrong, just because I know. <laughs> and the other thing as well is, there's, they mentioned in the article, uh, is it's always been the case that you have like these um, capture farms. So... You've got people in around the world paid like fractions of a cent to answer captures all day, which is, oh, I'm gonna, where's you know what's the world coming to when you need to do that? It's terrible. I know, I know. Well, I think that's about the the end of it. Before we finish off, I just want to um, say an important announcement. Al, dear Al, is leaving us after what nine years of uh, yeah. plus of working in rather inventive. And I I worked with you before that in a previous company, Freya. So. It's probably uh, over 11, 12 something like years. That, yeah, like long that. time. So I just wanted to, before before you leave, I just wanted to share a few pictures from the times of um, oh, I have hair, from the, the beginning, the beginning days. I still use those notebooks. And yeah, um, oh, yeah you do. Yeah. It's a different book. Obviously very good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you do write lots of notes. Oh, um, so this I'm was the time the that back in That is embarrassing. Yes. See? So for those, for those listening, I'm sharing a PDF of um, images of Al over the years where we used to meet up quite regularly and take photos and document those meetups. In this picture is Dan as well, who used to work with us. He was in for about two years, I think, a year and a bit um, before he left. So yeah, that was back in 2010. We've got another one here of Al becoming a cat. Al on the phone, pretending he's on the phone at least, and Al being another cat. <laughs> Next up, we've got actually Left Bank. I remember this one. And you've got Liz, our, our accountant at the time. Um, Dan, you were actually quite nice to I just went that way recently. Like that. Just disintegrated. Did you? Uh, yeah. Uh, this was in the courtyard, Hereford, I think upstairs. That looks in the like courtyard. the that looks like Lovely. interview day off The Apprentice, apart from I'm not wearing the right clothes. <laughs> Often at these um, meetups, we would... Um, I think this pieces out after a little while. I think you got fed up with me asking to do this. But we would ha- each... Ha- one, have, one of us would have to do a presentation on something we'd learnt that month. 
um, various different things. And this may be Dan giving a presentation on something he'd learned. Then yeah. do you remember this? So this yeah, was a yeah, team yeah, building yeah. day and Ross, a colleague of ours who um, works, we, we sort of work with on some other projects. He, he works for Two Heads, um, which is like an exhibition company. He was joining us for the day because I think he was a freelance marketing manager at the time. Oh, let's see if we've got any other images. Okay, so this is Al um, shooting from the hip, sort of, so, so to speak, with one hand with a crossbow. Not quite sure what you were shooting. I remember now. You looked like you were focusing <laughs> quite hard. Look at our t-shirts though. Look at those. I've still got do you t-shirt? those t-shirts. I do, I wear it for painting. <laughs> um, moving on to the next one, we've just got a group shot with a um, someone jumping in, photo bombing. I don't know who that was, but she just sort of jumped into the picture at the end. <laughs> Brilliant. So this is Al taking a rare moment of uh, time to himself just to check some emails. Uh, outside, That's I can't remember the place. It was, a, a, yeah. it was a spa, Homer, yeah. Homer Spa in Hereford. Moving on, we've got this place. This was um, in Hereford, and it was a little cafe, Cafe Green, I think it's called oh, yeah. in the title there. And it was like a health, healthy cafe that did a lot of vegetarian food. Not sure that pleased Dan, but it was quite nice, I thought. Next on the list, this is somewhere we went to for Christmas. I think, I think this was a bunch of carrots just outside oh, yeah. Hereford. Oh. Um, do you remember this one? We went to East North Pottery. <laughs> yeah, I do, yeah. And that's a picture of Dan not looking very happy about yeah. the pot he's making. There's Lou in the foreground, Helen Caldercott oh, yeah. in the back. She yeah. used to work with her doing um, yeah. workshops. One here, all of us. I've actually got those egg cups, still use them. Have you? <laughs> We we do have some. There was a, there was a couple of nice ones we made for uh, which we use for olives. Apart from that, the rest were a little bit small. <laughs> Moving through, this was later in the evening. I've actually got some more pictures which I thought I won't show because they they're embarrassing for people. Um, so this is going out in the evening for some food. Um, do you remember this? That's place? Chepstow. Now Chepstow, what I'm showing, that's like the best what, what, the best breakfast roll you're ever ever gonna eat in your whole life. Now, I think we've talked about this a few different <laughs> times, maybe even on the podcast, but here is a picture of it. It's basically um, this, we went, we'd stored it at a breakfast and this is how it came. And it's a sourdough, like a baguette, sliced diagonally. And then within those little slices, not all the way through, it's just like half slice through. You've got a lovely poached egg, you've got this crispy bacon, you've got a sausage and um, mushroom in there as well. I don't know if they still do this, but at some point we should go back because it, it was it was amazing. Very, very tasty. This is us on a very bright day, so bright that Al just couldn't handle it anymore. And he's just crying with the brightness. We were looking into the sun. I, I have no clue where it is. <laughs> it's just a funny no picture. Idea. Now, do you remember this? This is 2012, oh, yeah. back in yeah, Herefordshire. We got a tour around Chase Brewery. So who have we got in this picture? We've got Al in the foreground, looking shocked. Why do something. I always look like I've been sure. living in a hedge in the most of the photos? Um, do you remember this one? This is Christmas 2013. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Lempster with um, cooking. Right, That's right. Months, it was at Ar yeah, it's a while ago. Ar Ar Arga Twyford. What else have we got here? A um, bit more recent, a bit of a blurry photo, but it's um, Al and I in the Toro Lounge in Gloucester, I seem to remember. One of, one of the lounge bars in Gloucester on the docks in 2014. And this is the picture taken afterwards. Al and I needed some new profile photos. I still photos, like I've so been dragged out of a hedge, though. That's... I do. I've got to work on that. I still use I know, my profile know, photo from want, this day. I do need royalties. Sorry, royalty payments for that photo. <laughs> now, I've got card of question mark. Um, what, what was it? Newport. Newport. Oh, it's Port 18. It was Port 18. It's Newport. That's right. So yeah. it's a conference run by Joel yeah. Hughes. I That's might have right. got his name wrong. Um, but he ran, he ran, I don't know if he just still does, but he ran a conference called Port 80. And uh, we tried to go to those when, when they were on quite a good conference really sort mm. of a bit more technical web angle but yeah good, good fun exactly. actually um this was quite recent so this um was team day out where we went to an escape room in gloucester uh, this is back in 2017 my, my um, enjoying memory from that will be uh, watching catherine trying to log into a, a windows computer from a distance using uh, a walking stick <laughs> yeah she was tapping at the keyboard with it <laughs> <laughs> oh that that really is oh, that, that, i will never forget yeah, that. We, it was we, were so thinking, funny. You know, we know computers we can get around this there must be some back oh, it's so funny to... and, and, and ended up being totally unnecessary which made it even funnier and this is the, i think this is the most recent latest picture i've got of you, Al, and it's with your back to me and i maybe maybe that is something uh, you know something to be said that was a sign of the times and um, where you were looking to to other things um, so this is al you were taking some photos uh for um one of our clients at castle yeah. Peak. is that right uh, we were down at a race event there motorbike racing event and al was taking some photos right on the in the in the i don't know what you call them but right in against the, the wall the they track. call it just thought it'd be quite nice oh. to share that with well, thank you very much that was brilliant yes. having never saved any of these photos um, that's um, saved me a job so thank you I'll send you the PDF. 
No, thank you, Alex. It's been great working with you. I don't know, are you able to share just a loose idea of what you'll be going on? Today? I'm sort of sidestepping a little bit out of web development um, purely. So I'm going to be working more with like chatbot technology. And I think that's got a massive future in terms of kind of self-service, like information service to people. Um, I'm going to be working more in kind of like customer service for that, I guess. That, that's what the chatbot I'll be working on. Chatbots generally, I think, have got a lot of future and I can see many sites not really needing to be a site uh, and really being a sort of information portal and just saying, well, how much does it cost to get delivery, <laughs> next day delivery? And it just says 10 quid. Fine. You no, know, so it's that. It's, yeah. the, it's the kind of flipping on its head a little bit and, and getting people to ask questions of this service rather than sort of finding it themselves. I mean, it is kind of, I suppose you could say it's a glorified FAQ, but it, it's much more than that. Yeah. So it's going to be, um, it's going to be a whole new, yeah. um, whole new world, really, in terms of that. <laughs> Oh, well, I, I hope, hope it goes you. well. And uh, as I said, you, you, you won't be coming on so regularly, but hopefully we can have you back at some point. Otherwise, th thank you very much, Alex. It's been, it's been great. I, um, you know, have a, have a good time and we'll, we'll catch oh, up. Thank you very much. The time has flown by. Literally, I didn't realise it had been sort of 12 years <laughs> until you look back and you think, wow, OK. <laughs> so, yeah, it's been lots of fun. Learned a lot. Worked with some amazing clients. Um, so, yeah, it's been a really great experience. So thank you. Thanks. Um, I certainly know it's been that long as my hair start, is starting to thin. It's certainly oh, been yeah, quite about time. It. Right, so to finish off, you can find the show notes for this episode on our website, ratherinventive.com slash podcast, and look for episode 33. Uh, get in touch with us by sending in your business, marketing, or creativity questions for the next episode. You can tweet at ratherinventive, or you can just email hello at ratherinventive.com. The sponsor was uh, Inventive People, and if you buy anything online, you can get 20% off your first order with discount code Inventive Podcast. I think that's it. The future of this podcast will change, but I'm hoping that we'll have a nice selection of uh, some guests that you've that you've heard of before and some guests you haven't. Um, I'm sure they won't stand up to to you, Alan, replacing um, you as a as a co presenter. But we will do our best. I'll, I'll write a chat um, just to fill in for me. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, we'd love that next time. Thanks very much for listening. Bye now. Bye.